A whopping 66 million years ago, a massive rock slams into Mexico making what we now call the Chicxulub impact. It's a big deal because it's connected to the time when dinosaurs waved goodbye, a real game changer in Earth's story. The impact's aftermath, including wildfires and a nuclear winter effect, significantly altered Earth's climate and led to the extinction of about 75% of Earth's species, marking the end of the Cretaceous period. The Chicxulub crater wasn't discovered until the late 20th century. Despite the colossal impact occurring millions of years ago, it remained hidden beneath layers of sediment. The discovery in the 1990s confirmed the impacts significant in Earth's history. The Chicxulub crater is massive, with an estimated diameter of around 150 kilometers, that is 93 miles. These events are like cosmic bookmarks in Earth's diary. They teach us tons and leave us curious for more. We have heard that dinosaurs went extinct because asteroid uh -huh. hit. But then they say that it's like million, 66 million years, some, some million year ago. How do someone tell that it is so many years ago? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that falls in the field of geology, okay. uh, broadly speaking. Okay. But... It involves you looking at the rock layers right. and figuring out what those compositions are. Are they common to what is around you? And if there is one sort of um, anomaly, mm -hmm. then you start to answer a question of, okay, where, how, what is this anomaly? How can you, what makes it so different? Where else have we found this? If it happened to, right. and then like, you know, with the landscape, are we seeing certain distinct changes in like the, the layering itself, you would assume is always going to be flat. But again, right. if you have faults or other movements in the crust, it's going to shift a little. And so you yeah. can sort of peel those. And with the Chicxulub, that was mm -hmm. the event that yeah. eventually led to dinosaurs extinction. extinction. That was an actual impact event. Right. So for those who study impact craters, especially mm -hmm. in the field, mm -hmm. they would look for some markers mm -hmm. and to understand, okay, are we in a crater site or not? And this mm -hmm. is, again, based on we now have 200 odd craters on Earth. Okay. So that we have some geological record to compare to. Mm -hmm. And that's how they figure out that, oh, yeah, this is the one that it was such a massive event that it, in fact, once the impact happened, it released material into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and there was certain material like compositionally very unique mm -hmm. to this impact happening because the maybe the colliding body mm -hmm. had some features characteristics and that is what eventually sort of became a layer and it actually moved globally okay. so there were now other places far away from this Chicxulub event mm -hmm where they were seeing the same traces right? at the same layering levels that they could make the connection being like, oh, this is part of the same global event, right. which then helped them understand that, oh, okay. And then if you also look at fossil records. Mm -hmm. So if you're able to, from the dinosaur angle, <laughs> know that, oh, these are the, you know, there's a whole debris over here. Mm -hmm. That is all of these dinosaurs, which we know happened from this um, era to, you know, million years and right. all of that. Then it's jigsaw. So, in that particular event, was it just like one asteroid that might have fallen or maybe it must have been one which might have got divided into many or there might have been uh, many small, small asteroids? So, I mean, with this event, we know what the final feature width is. Mm -hmm. The unique thing with this particular event was that it ended up becoming a feature that was part land and part in the ocean. Okay. Or in the, yeah. I feel like that was... Was it near the Mexico area? Like Yeah, the, yeah. So there's okay, a yeah. there's an area called Chicxulub. Okay, That's why okay. the whole event and impact uh, Chicxulub? feature... Chicxulub? Yeah. Oh, Chicxulub. don't ask me to swear. <laughs> Chicxulub. We can Google it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that is the yeah. third largest impact event on Earth. Okay. Um, oh, and so, so they know because of... They actually accidentally came across this feature because it was originally used for drilling oil. 
so they were getting drill cores which okay. again is all part of the geology thing you mm-hmm. you have to drill in in into the ground mm-hmm. and at a certain you know at least half a kilometer length right. you're getting the sequence of the rocks right. and in that they were able to find that there was this one distinct layer that they were like what is this where did it come from right. etc and as they drilled on more sites etc they started to realize oh this is how the you can look at that rock layering and you can start to say okay this is how they are stacked right. and sometimes that stack may be even throughout all the points where you're mm-hmm. drilling or you might see that oh there's a shift right it all moved up by this much why did it move up and so it it's part of that sort of questioning um but um to your question i mean when an impact event happens what ends up hitting is not the same size as what started to come through the atmosphere the atmosphere is really breaking things down yeah and so, so this is why you see be. shooting stars right. what we call shooting stars mm-hmm. is really a piece of rock from space that happens to be coming through earth's atmosphere okay. but by the time it has started and it's making its way through to eventually hit it has disintegrated because the atmosphere is adding friction and that right. friction is going to make it break apart okay. and so it's not i so i don't personally know about the chicxulub event but i wouldn't be surprised if it was a large thing that ended up breaking into smaller but there was still a large chunk in that that hit and caused right. the main crater has there any time been any asteroid that hit on the planet and it turned out to be like a million dollar worth i don't know on the dollar value but i will say yeah it <laughs> happens if you again google mm-hmm. you will find instances where it's like someone was at their home and they heard a huge thud and then they were like what happened and it just so happened it's very rare mm-hmm. but it has happened where it has happened to like hit on the roof of a car and someone was filling gas okay or you know it just hit on the roof of <laughs> no, a house something falling yeah, on my head yeah and it was <laughs> so so that's where it is rare and of course if you speak to people who are in museums etc they constantly get calls being like is this a meteorite and all of oh, that because okay. yes but you know so th- i will say th- google will tell you how many times it has happened mm-hmm. um one to two at least in the last and and actually i've been part of a meteorite search too mm-hmm. um back in i want to say this was when i was at western so i want to say 2008 or 9 or something mm-hmm. there was a meteorite fall that okay. we all knew had happened mm-hmm. and then there was a researcher out of western's physics and astronomy who does meteorites as their mm-hmm. work and so we were all asked would anyone like to help us find yeah. meteorite samples because the key is that you want to capture those samples closest to when it has hit right any longer earth and erosion and all of that atmosphere yeah. and will start to change its uh, element yeah so you want it to be as pristine as possible right. and and there are um, you know cameras that are always looking at the night sky to understand if they are seeing these sort of meteor fireballs etc they are able to figure out which part of the solar system that came from that is how much mm-hmm. advanced it has become in the last 10 years or more mm-hmm. because of the ability to set up cameras and it becomes a network right. you are looking at this part of the sky i'm looking at this part of the sky let's all like and and so then the researchers or the scientists and and all of them they are actually reviewing that and are like ha huh, this is how we know that it's this kind of meteorite from this part of the right. and we're like oh my gosh <laughs> so it's do you think happened. that in future scientists would uh, come up with some sort of uh, tool where if there is a huge meteor coming towards the earth they can divert it like go that side ah uh, look up <laughs> again google dart mission okay. um they literally sent yeah. out a a, a a mission okay. a satellite uh, basically the intention was to go to this mini asteroid mm-hmm. and literally jam right into it to see if it, they could deflect the orbit okay and they now under, have figured out that it happened 3 2 1 for the first time ever Humanity has changed the orbit of a planetary object. NASA 
confirms that DART successfully changed the targeted asteroid's trajectory. Using the ground-based telescopes around the world to watch the system and see how it's affected by this impact event. This is a watershed moment for planetary defense and a watershed moment for humanity. And it was able to deflect. It was not planned to hit Earth for mm -hmm. at least centuries. Oh. But they still wanted to try it. And so, yeah, they have tried it. Okay. And there is, uh, there is effort being put mm -hmm. to figuring things like that. Because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's where the more you know of what's around Earth, the easier it is to figure out its orbits and all of that, right? So, yeah, actually, that's, that's really interesting. Because sometimes I wonder, like, how would we save the world if an asteroid is coming and hitting us? Don't let, like, like, Hollywood, like, you know, <laughs> cloud you are like... Hmm. Movie based on that. Oh, yeah? It's Independence like a, Day? Yeah, Independence Day something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, Independence Day. That was, like, you know, Where of course, it? Hollywood issue. Yeah. Like, we got to save the Earth. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, there are, there are people who are working on trying <laughs> yeah. to do this. The only thing, I, I mean, everyone reminds the general public is that it's not happening anytime soon right. and for again this is where we don't we can't always predict when right. a thing is coming even if we have all eyes on that yeah. sometimes you know it'll just come from an angle that you did not even, even plan or yeah. expect but fun fact on the day i was defending my phd mm -hmm. it was supposed to start at 10 a.m or something so i'm getting there early mm -hmm. And literally, as I'm walking into the room, the buzz of the room was, oh, did you see this on the, you know, and again, we had, I think, mm -hmm. YouTube and stuff by then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it just so happened in Russia, mm -hmm. over the skies of Russia, there was a huge fireball that had just happened about maybe a few hours prior, but it was early morning. No, right. So we were all just cluing in and it was a meteor event where they the dash cams of the Russians who were driving around there happened to capture as this was going across the daylight sky so they mm -hmm. could still see it it broke apart into smaller bits mm -hmm. one of them landed into a lake somewhere mm -hmm. and I think it was I mean it wasn't large enough but it eventually disintegrated so no except for the lake hitting one mm -hmm. nothing else survived right. uh, and but the windows and everything shattered Oh. So this is a pretty significant event mm -hmm. that everyone in the community was like, oh, what is this? Can we find again? Can we? No one predicted that was happening. It just happened. Now, no matter how much you think you want to know ahead of time if something is coming, it yeah. always just happens. Yeah. So you learn from it. <laughs> right. So there is the satellite. It goes to another planet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It has to land on the ground. Not necessary, okay. but okay. But if it, ha like like a rover thing, huh, okay. in order if it has to look at what exactly is there. How is it supposed to land? How does it know that, okay, it is landable? So is your crater studies used for that purpose? Or like how exactly do they determine to land a rover? <laughs> Great question. Yes, so cratering is the most common geological features mm -hmm. on any rocky surface okay earth also has it right. we just don't see enough of it because yeah. of other reasons but every <laughs> body has experienced some small rock coming and hitting it at yeah. force so craters are really one way to kind of you know understand the interiors of other bodies but it is so common that it is mixing things around as it keeps happening um and so uh, I guess with that, I was again looking at it on Venus, on mm. Earth, on the Moon, and and things. But to to answer your question, how do they figure out where to land? That is a whole team, really. When you look at missions, mm -hmm. there is a whole science team mm -hmm. that is looking not just at where they want to land, but what do they already know. So right. this is where past missions mm -hmm. will help you. Or again, it's a jigsaw puzzle, right? right? So you're looking at past information to help you understand, okay, this is where, this is how this landscape looks like. On Earth, we have mountains, we have yeah. oceans, etc. But on other surfaces, you have a variety of right. those features. It could be smooth, it could be mountainous, it could be really rough. And so because we have now... 50 plus years of space exploration has explored all corners of our solar system, right. including the sun. So 
when you look at mm-hmm. a rocky surface, you're like, okay, what do we know? We may have only little information, yeah. but now if we are sending new instruments and things like that, we can actually improve on what we are learning. Right. And this is where you don't want to send humans in these early stages. You get other, you know, automated things to figure this out for you, and then the humans will only go and explore when really you need that. critical thinking right. process of it so okay yeah it is a real combination of looking at what we already mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. what we know what we want to find out right and then what is your for a rover how big is your rover right what are what is the space limit of instruments on there what kinds of instruments again that's where the science questions dif- decide on what co- instruments you would add this is where the engineers come in and will be like ah uh, Okay, so if we have to land this, we need to have the sort of dynamics of the bo- the s- landing place right, <laughs> known. Right. Is there an atmosphere? Is there a gravity? How much of that is going to help drive? You know, the speeds at which is go- even up to like launch date. When right. the launch date is happening, it's known because they have to figure out how best that launch and travel time, etc., will then lead to it actually. landing in a spot that you want and they have what's called a landing ellipse okay so it's never going to be a point okay, they know okay. that we want to ideally land somewhere here yeah yeah okay okay and then they have to figure <laughs> out after it has landed again where did it land because right. you might think on a map it's very small and oh you can see it of but course. when you actually <laughs> land somewhere new imagine you don't mm-hmm. have walkie talkies here it's a very slow process right so right. you kind of have to um be able to switch or to digest what you already have to like oh i'm now on the ground i'm seeing that rock i think that rock from space looks like this <laughs> okay. and that's where it's a, it's still like you have to rely on what you can train yourself to understand 